Hello, good morning. This is Rick Pina, and I'm bringing you today's word for June 14, 2022. <laughs> 2024, I'm sorry. I'm teaching a series entitled, How to Live Your Life with a Laser Focus on God's Fixed Purpose. How to Become the Man or the Woman God has Called You to Be, and it's all about Him. It's about His plans, His destiny, whatever it is that it is His purpose for your life. It's not about us. It's all about him. So it's about us discovering the purpose and then dying to self, dying to sin, self, and selfishness long enough for us to become who it is that God has called us to be in so we can leave a mark in this world that will not easily be erased. We've been studying the life of Joseph, and we're at a point in the story where Joseph's dad is just like, oh my God, the blessing was so overwhelming where the Bible says he couldn't believe it. And so I'm going to talk about the power of belief and hope. Put that in the chat, the power of belief and and hope, where God will bless you so good that you're like, oh my God, this is like, I, I almost can't believe it. That type of blessing. Let's get ready for it. I want you to open up your heart to receive. All right, so let's get into it. The power of belief and hope. I don't ever want you to be hopeless because you're never hopeless. As a believer, you're never hopeless because you're never helpless. God is on you and in you and with you and for you. The power of belief and hope. I'm a believer. Say I'm a believer. All right. Proverbs chapter four and verse 25 is foundational scripture for this series. It is. It says this, set your gaze on the path before you with fixed purpose, looking straight ahead, ignore life's distractions. Say that. Say, I ignore life's distractions. I'm looking straight ahead. It's forward ever, backward never, the best is yet to come. Another scripture we've been looking at for a couple of months now, James chapter one, verses two through four says this, my fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulty, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it actually develops inside of you the power to endure all things. And then this power to endure all things is endurance. This endurance is called grace. As it is developed in you, it releases perfection into every part of your being until there's nothing missing and nothing lacking. Say that there's nothing missing and nothing lacking for me, right? The King James says you can be perfect and entire wanting nothing. And that's where I want to get to, where I'm, I'm walking with God and living by faith so strong, I'm not moved by what I see. And the outside, my external doesn't dictate my internal. So my internal state is not based on external circumstances. When you get to that point, the Bible says you're mature. You're a mature believer where you're not fluctuating. You're not being driven with the wind. You're, you're not being changed by the circumstances that are changing. I'm not allowing what I see on the news or what happens or an email that I get or a text message to just ruin my life. No, I have a, a level of internal stability and, and I have joy and peace. And so I'm not moved, right? I know that God is going to do what God said he was going to do in my life and I'm not going to be moved. Say amen to that. That's, that's how, what it looks like to be mature. Somebody said, that's me. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, there's a right time for everything and everything on earth is going to happen at just the right time. So what you got to do is you got to believe and hold on long enough. To, to see what God said. So let me set the stage for you before I really get into my points. I have three points, but before we get into the points, let me set the stage. In this series, I believe that I've been very explicitly clear that God made plans for you before the world began, right? That you're not a mistake, that God sent you to this planet at just the right time, that you're anointed for such a time as this. I've also made it clear that these plans will manifest in the fullness of God's timing. So the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And things are going to happen in your life at the right time, right? So you got to believe. And when and a lot of times we ask God to do something and then we're like, why is this taking so long? And then when God finally does it, you're like, "Ooh, his timing was good. Lord, thank you for not giving it to me when I asked for it because my timing was off. You know what I'm saying? God knows all things. So what this does is this, this leaves us in a position where we have to live by faith and patience. That's Hebrews 6 and 12, where we live by faith, but we have to add patience to our faith. Say that. Say, I add patience to my faith. So it is through faith and patience that we obtain the promises of God. We we actually get to see what God said manifested. So the point that I'm making today is that when it finally happens, when you finally receive it, 
when God finally manifests the promise that you've been waiting on for all this time, because God's ways are above our ways, because God's thoughts are above our thoughts, God is not just on another level. He's on another plane. He's on another dimension. So when God finally does it, <laughs> in most cases, it will exceed your wildest imaginations. Efe uh, Ecclesiastes, I mean, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3 and 20 is driving home the point that God will basically, he will blow our mind. Like, I mean, it would be something from another level. And so we're going to look at this from two perspectives today, the perspective of Joseph and the perspective of Jacob. Now let's, let's talk about Joseph first. And, and I've been talking about Joseph for over two months now. From Joseph's perspective, the day his life changed forever came after 13 years of living as a slave and as a prisoner. But that particular morning, the, the, the morning I'm talking about, the day he left the prison, that morning he woke up in prison and he went to sleep in the palace. He woke up as a prisoner. He went to sleep as the number two man in the land. He woke up as a prisoner. He went to sleep as the prime minister of Egypt. He was promoted from prisoner to prime minister in one day. And this is the type of thing that when it happens, it's almost surreal. Like you, Isabella and I have been there many times where we're experiencing something and we go, wow, babe, this is, this is crazy, right? I mean, like, like God is so good that like, you know, it's happening. Like, I mean, like, you know, like, you know, oh, it's, I, I pinched myself. It's really happening, but it's so good that is almost too hard to believe. And so when, when Joseph was going to sleep that night in the palace, after spending 13 years as a slave and as a prisoner, I'm sure he was like, oh my God, this finally happened. And that is almost like, uh, like no, no way. Like not in a thousand years would Joseph had imagined. I mean, he knew he was going to get something, but he didn't, he didn't know it was going to be that. Right. So let's talk about Jacob. Jacob is in the middle of a famine. The famine has been going on for two years. They had plenty of food and plenty of money. So obviously, they, he was able to sustain his family for two years. Well, eventually, the food ran out. The money didn't run out, but the food ran out. So now that the food ran out, they're like, okay, Egypt is the only nation in the area with food. So he sends his 10 sons to go buy some food. And when they come back, they don't just come back with food. Right, and we know the whole thing that they came back, got Benjamin, all that. Okay, but now eleven sons come back, and they don't come back with food. They came back with food. They came back with vehicles. They came back with gifts. They came back with clothes, and then they come back with news. What's the news? Oh my God, the news was better than all the money and all the clothes and all the food. The, the news. What was the news? Hey, your son that you thought has been dead for twenty-two years, he's alive. Not only is he alive, but he's the ruler of Egypt. Not only is he alive, he's the ruler of Egypt. Oh my God, oh my God. Exceedingly abundantly above. Guess what? That, what? He wants us to go to Egypt and they're going to bless us with houses and land and food and everything that we need. And they said that the, the famine is going gonna, is gonna to keep going for five more years, but, but it doesn't matter. They got us. That Joseph is in a position to where he's going to bless the whole family and take care of us for the next five years and everything will be taken care of. And we're about to get houses and land and all this stuff. Oh my God. And this was one of those like, oh my, this is too good to be true kind of moments. Yeah. And so, so I'm telling you, when God finally does it, God... God will blow your mind. I mean, we serve a God that will exceed your wildest imaginations. This is why I keep telling you, you got to be open to it. You got to keep hope alive. You got to believe God. The, now I'm a, let me, I, oof, this is so good. I'm, now I'm going to cover what actually happened in Genesis chapter 45, verses 21 through 26. Instead of reading it to you, let me kind of summarize these verses. By this point in the story, we know that both Pharaoh and Joseph had already promised Goshen to the family, right? The best part of Egypt was promised to them. All these boys had to do was go get their father and go get their families and bring and come back. And Pharaoh said, don't even bring stuff. Just, just, just go get everybody. Come on, man. Don't even bring stuff. And he sent them. When Joseph sent them away, he sent them with gifts, right? So they go, they left to go to Egypt on donkeys. And when they come back, they have royal wagons, royal chariots, right? 
Like, if it was today, it would be like a, a, a whole fleet of G-Wagons or Escalades outside. Like, I mean, so this stuff is like the best of the best vehicles outside because Pharaoh was like, when, when, when the women and children come back, I don't want them riding on donkeys. I want them to be comfortable coming back. So, so they, uh, Benjamin, everybody, all the sons were giving clothes, right? Benjamin was giving more clothes than them, <laughs> right? All, everybody was giving uh, money, but Benjamin was giving more money than them. Joseph also sent the donkeys, watch this. There were the donkeys that came. The donkeys were loaded up. There were 10 donkeys that were loaded up with the best gifts that Egypt had to offer for their father. And another 10 donkeys were loaded up with bread and other food just for the return trip. It was like, I just need you to have enough food to get back here because once you get back here, you don't have to worry about a thing. And so he's like, leave from Canaan, come back to Egypt, and I got you. And, and then the father's told that, that Joseph is alive and he's the ruler of Egypt. And the Bible says in verse 26, he could not believe it. I mean, he, he, he was like, what? It was like, he could not believe it. The son he had not seen in 22 years. The son he thought was dead. The son that was the firstborn son from the woman that he loves. Not only was he alive, but he was the ruler of Egypt. Not only was he the ruler of Egypt, but he was rich. Not only was he the ruler of, of Egypt and rich and powerful, but he's saying, come, I'm giving you houses and land and I'm going to take care of you for the next five years. Don't worry about a thing. Oh my God. What does this mean for you today? I have three things to share with you on this Friday morning. Y'all ready? Three things. Number one, when your breakthrough comes, it will seem almost too hard to believe. I mean, like, like when, when it finally happens, look, let, let me just pause real quick and talk about me and Isabella for a minute. When actually Monique Farrell is watching, Monique went to our house in, in, in Colleen, Texas. When Isabella and I got married and Isabella did a, an amazing job of making that house a home. But when Isabella and I got married, we bought a house that was $58,000. And I think it was like 1,200, 1,300 square foot. And we moved into this house. And first of all, it was it was better than she was already better than any, you know, the way that she grew up. And we didn't even have a house when I was growing up, like, you know, my family. And then later we bought a house in the Dominican Republic, but we didn't have one in the U.S. So anyway, we move into this house and Isabella, of course, she did what she does and she made it a beautiful home. But my point is that when we first got married and we was like, we would think about like, what are we going to do with our future and all of that? Like, you know, what are we going to do, babe? What are you going to do, babe? What, what are you, you know, she was like, what, what do you see us being? You know, there's no way. Like, you know, all these years later, there's no way. Like, I, like where we are now and then where we're going. Like what God has called us to do to make... Matter of fact, Isabella's getting ready to go to Africa. She's about to go to Africa right now. And she's going to go to Africa on a missions trip and all of that. And then we have the, the school in the Dominican Republic. When I think about like ministry, when I think about what we're called to do, when I think about the impact and, you know, everything, like our lives, there are many moments where it's just like we would have never imagined this. And not only that, the, we're just getting started. Like, I mean, like... God, what God has called us to do, there's so many more things that God has called us to do. I'm getting ready for this, um, for this summer. I want us to give, last summer we gave away 700 backpacks full of school supplies. This summer we're going to give out 750. So pretty soon I'm going to put out um, a, um, a link on our website so where you can donate for the back to school drive. And I want you to donate um, if you're led. But anyway, when Jacob was told that his long lost son, the one that he loved, the one that he thought was dead, was alive. And not only that, he was the ruler of Egypt. It was almost just too much for him to digest. It was one of those like too, too good to be true moments. Right. And, but, but it was true. And so how does this apply to you? Listen, when a pastor or a preacher declares a word of the Lord, either from the Bible or prophetically, and the word of the Lord that comes to you and God is speaking to you, and it's a good word that God wants to bless you in a good way, let, I'm, I'm going to just be, be transparent. A lot of Christians I've been in ministry now for over 28 years. A lot of Christians have a belief problem. A lot of Christians have, they, they know God is good and they know God can do great things, but they can't see God doing it for them. And so, is, so when the goodness of God is being declared, they cannot seem to grasp that reality for themselves. God is speaking to them and telling them that God wants to do what God wants to do and it's a wonderful thing. And they cannot see this wonderful thing happening for them. It's not that they don't believe God can do it. They just don't believe that God will do it for them. And the sad part is that if you remain in unbelief, then God is not free. 
to do what he wants to do in your life. When Jesus went home to his hometown, the Bible says he could not do many great miracles there. It doesn't say he didn't want to. He couldn't do it. Why? Because of their unbelief. Your unbelief hinders the hand of God. God wants to bless you because God wants to bless you because God is good. But if you don't believe it, you're holding God back. So you, this is why I keep telling you, don't be closed. I keep telling you, be open. Be open to whatever God wants to do, however what God wants to do it. Stop limiting God. You limit God by your inability to believe. I, that's why I'm preaching the, and teaching the word of God. And I keep telling you, expand your capacity to believe God. I want you to be open to whatever God wants to do, however God wants to do it. And I pray that this series is helping you to expand your capacity to believe God. Because when God is ready to do it, it's going to be one of those, oh my God, can you believe this kind of moments? And so we serve a God that will exceed your wildest imaginations. You got to believe in a God that can do exceedingly abundantly above. And listen, when God wants to bless you, it's because God is good, not because you're good. So you got to grow your faith to the point where you believe in a limitless God, a God of no limits. So you stop hindering God. Say amen to that. Put in the chat, I will stop hindering God. You got it? All right. Number two, there will come a day where God will exceed your greatest imaginations and expectations. And then after you get past that, there will come another day where he will do it again. And after you get past that, <laughs> there will come another day where he will do it again. After 22 years of being disconnected from his family, and Joseph spent 13 of those 22 years as a slave and as a prisoner, when the reunion came, it was greater than he imagined. I mean, he wept uncontrollably. He couldn't believe it. Paul said this. Uh, this is Ephesians 3 and 20 from uh, the Passion Translation, I believe. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you to accomplish all of this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request. He will achieve more than your most unbelievable dream. And he will exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. That's Ephesians 3 and 20 from the Passion Translation. There's nothing God can't do. And when God does it, he will do it and he will blow your mind. The Bible says that when Jacob experienced all of this, he could not believe it. <laughs> he was like, he went outside and he saw the wagons and the chair. And matter of fact, at, at, at the beginning, he didn't believe it. He said, there's no way. But, but when he went outside and saw the wagons and the chariots and the animals and the food, then he was like, okay, well, I guess this is true, right? And so looking at all the evidence, he was saying, okay, now I can believe you. He was saying, now Joseph must really be alive. And then he said this, I will get to see him before I die. This man lived for 22 years thinking his son, the one that he loved, his favorite son was dead. And after he looked at all that stuff, he said, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I believe it. And then he said this, forget the money, forget the outfits, forget the houses and the land. He said, man, I'm going to get to see my son before I die. He said, man, like, like, he was like, you guys don't understand how much pain I've been through for 22 years. And I'm going to, this is God, God is like, answer my prayers. I'm going to get to see my son before I die. I'm going to be reunited with all 12 of my boys before I die. Father's Day is coming up. This is one of those Father's Day moments. He was like, man, I'm like, he, forget the money. He was like, the money, uh, that's not even, <laughs> he was like, man, I'm about to, I'm about to be reunited with all 12 of my boys and it's going to happen before I die. Listen, I'm telling you, man, this is one of those God wants to bless you moments. This is why I keep telling you greater is coming for you. How does this apply to you? You got to trust that we serve a God that can exceed your wildest imaginations and your expectations. So you got to keep believing. You got to keep your faith up, your belief up, your strength up, remain in faith. You got to believe that God can do it and he could do it in a moment. And when God finally does it, it, it might seem too good to be true, but it will be true because it will be part of God's plan. You got to remember that God's timing is perfect. And when fi God finally does it, there's a the right time for everything. And everything on earth is going to happen at just the right time. And you got to believe that when it finally does happen, it's going to be so good that you're going to be like, oh my God, right? So you got to re remain hopeful, keep believing, and know that it can happen at any time. So live with an expectation of manifestation. You got it? All right, number three, last point so I can let you go. 
Your work is to believe God. Say, say that. Say, my work is to believe. Put in the chat, say, I'm a believer. In the New Testament, the disciples asked Jesus this question. What must we do to do the work that God requires? This is John 6, 28, 29. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe on the one that he sent. Listen, your work is to believe. Say, my work is to believe. You're called a believer for a reason. You have to believe God. Jacob had a hard time believing, like, oh my God. But he finally had to believe it, right? And unfortunately, many Christians today, they have a hard time believing stuff until they see it. Jacob didn't believe until he went outside and said, oh, oh, oh. He had to see stuff with his own eyes before he believed. That's what happened to Thomas. That's why we call him Doubting Thomas. Do you know what happened with Thomas? Well, I'll just tell you the story. In the After the resurrection of Jesus, some of Jesus' disciples saw Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And they go back to the other, the other group of disciples who were in a room. And they, and they go back to him and they'd be like, yo, we saw Jesus. And Thomas said, nah, I don't believe you saw Jesus. It was like, no, 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 yo, dude, dude, we saw Jesus. He's alive. And he has a body and all that. We saw him. And Thomas said this, unless I see the holes in his hands, and unless, first of all, I got to see him with my own eyes, then I got to see the holes in his hands, then I need to put my hand in the side. Unless I do that, Thomas said, I will not believe, right? Fast forward a couple of days later, they're in that same room. Jesus walks through the wall like the matrix. Jesus is a bad dude. Jesus walks through the wall. Shoo, the door was closed, the Bible says. He walks through the wall. Shoo, he said, peace be unto you. Oh my God, Jesus is bad. He goes, shoo, peace be unto you. After he said, peace be unto you, the disciples are like, huh? he said, Thomas, come here. Touch my hand right here. He was like, huh? he said, put your hand right here. Huh? He said, Lord, I believe. He said, yeah, you believe because you see. But more blessed are those that believe without seeing. Jacob only believed after he saw the wagons and the food and the money and the clothes. But more blessed are those that believe without seeing. How does this apply to you so I can let you go this Friday? God does not think like you think, right? God's ways are above your ways and his thoughts are above your thoughts. God will exceed your wildest imaginations, but you got to stop limiting God with unbelief right? You, you got to stop being one of those people that say, well, I don't, I, I, I won't believe it until I see it. No, no, no. Actually, you won't see it until you believe it. In the kingdom of God, you got to stop thinking that way. Stop requiring God to give you proof, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that we cannot see. So if you really want to operate in faith, you got to believe things you can't see with your natural eyes. You got to stop limiting God and asking God to give you proof and to have to prove things to you. Listen, if God said it, that should settle it. Whether you like that's that's it. You got to open up your heart to believe it. You got you are a believer. You're called a believer for a reason. You got to be confident that God is going to do what God said he would, he's going to do. And all the proof you need is a word from God. You got to believe that you that this God that you cannot see is going to show up in, in your life in ways that you can see and that you're going to see it once God manifests it. But for right now, you're going to believe God. Say, I believe God. Say amen to that. Glory to God. And because of that, your hope is up. Your belief is up. Your expectation is up. Let's close this message out with a declaration of faith. Let me send you into Father's Day weekend with this declaration. Lift up your voice and say this. Say, Father, I open my heart wide to receive your extravagant, extraordinary, and overwhelming blessings. I trust that you will exceed my greatest expectations and my wildest dreams. I believe that your favor is on my life. So I stand firm in faith. I believe without seeing. I embrace the miraculous. The impossible is possible for you. So I expand my capacity to believe. And I take off every artificial limit I've ever placed on my limitless God. I rely on your timing and I know things will happen at just the right time. So I celebrate your goodness, I expect your favor, and I walk in your blessing. I boldly declare, greater is coming for me. I declare this by faith, in Jesus' name, amen. This is today's word. Please apply it and prosper. Now, if you're not getting my notes, I'm giving you my notes for free. <laughs> and so go to todaysword.org, click on the big red subscribe button, you're going to get all my notes in your email inbox every day for free. Listen, I love you. God loves you more. 
I want you to believe God. I want you to stop putting limits on a limitless God. I want you to open up your heart. Be open. Don't be closed. Whatever God wants to do, however God wants to do it. I love you. God loves you more. To all the fathers out there, have an amazing Father's Day. I pray that you feel loved and appreciated and surrounded with love, like Jacob was, <laughs> like, like one of those overwhelming moments. So have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday morning. Uh, do me a favor, three things. Leave me some comments in the chat if this message was a blessing to you. Um, number two, share this message on your social media, on your timeline with your friends. And number three, listen to the outro video. All right, God bless you. If our ministry is a blessing to you, please consider becoming a partner with Rick and Isabella Pena Ministries. Not only will you support the word of God going out on a daily basis, but you will also support our school in the Dominican Republic, where we are providing 200 Haitian children a Christ-based education free of charge and also a hot meal every day. If you want to become a partner with us, go to ripministries.org and you'll be able to do so there. If you don't have any of my materials, well, let me just show you a few things. Well, this is my first book, Level Up Your Life, where I cover how to level up your life in five areas of your life. Here's Grace-Based Success. It's a daily devotional where in 28 days, you'll be able to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's two affirmations books, one for men and one for women. These books will help you to align your faith, your heart, and your lips with the word of God. Or just go to rickpina.co. You'll see all the books there, apparel. Please make yourself available to those materials. They will be a blessing to you. Lastly, Isabella and I have been committed to coaching and mentorship for many, many years. And the Lord led me to use a platform where I could do it online, where we could leverage ourselves and scale. So now we have over 600 videos and continuing to grow. We're recording videos on a weekly basis where we're covering how to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and how to be successful as a Christian and in business and with relationships and etc. So if you're interested in that, please go to patreon.com forward slash Rick Pina. You will be blessed. Thank you for being a blessing to us, and we pray that we will continue to be a blessing to you.